Good morning, and welcome to First Lutheran Church, where we gather together to praise God. We are here as a community of faith to sing, to pray, to confess our sins, and to share a meal together. We are glad that you are joining us. If you would like a, a pastor to visit, we would be more than happy to come and see you. Just call the church office and we will arrange a time. Again, thank you for being a part of our worshiping community today at First Lutheran Church. God's blessings. Hey, as this, certainly a difference from last Sunday. So we went from sweltering 95 to comfortable 60 something maybe. <laughs> and I. I think this is rather nice and natural air conditioning. And it's nice, we're, we're kind of doing a non-Lutheran thing here by inviting you down to the front of the church. Uh, and I know sometimes sitting in the front row can be a little uncomfortable, but we do get a, a great discount on these seats. So, uh, <laughs> so we're glad that you're here. But we want you to be comfortable wherever you're at. We're just glad to have you take part in worship as we praise God together. A few announcements. Uh, last night, may maybe some of you were able to take part in Jazz Fest. It was a wonderful event on the lawns of First Lutheran. That guy over there is totally responsible for that event. Give him a hand, yeah. If you were here, you know it was a great event. And, and so many others, our uh, pie people and such, and others who uh, offered time and, and, and what not to make it that wonderful event. Uh, you have some other events coming up. Would you like to say a few words? Oh. First of all, thank you very much for everybody coming out. And I just want to let you all know, uh, we're still getting some totals coming in, but thanks to um, all of your gracious support, we are able to sponsor 50 kids for the Academy Arts programming for this coming year. So fantastic. And thank you, thank you, everybody who, who came out. Uh, I just uh, want to let everyone know, next Saturday at 6.30 p.m., we continue our summer concert series with the cellist Peter Swanson. He's coming and giving a really amazing uh, master, Masterworks of Cello concert at 6.30. That's here in the sanctuary next Saturday at 6.30. I invite you all to come and enjoy a wonderful evening of music hosted by cellist Peter Swanson. And for more information, you can check out uh, the event website, firstevents.org. That's firstevents.org. A uh, couple other things. Uh, Second Harvest is coming on the second Thursday of the month. They always need many volunteers to carry out this successful uh, service project that's been a part of First Lutheran for some time. If you can donate a little time between 3.30 and 5 p.m., I believe are the hours. Uh, and if it's great weather, they'll be outside to do the distribution. So hopefully uh, that can happen. I understand it's a little easier when it's outside than in. But if you can help out in any way, that would be appreciated. Also, um, the flowers on the altar, the purple bouquets are from the funeral of Phyllis Wells, held this week. We ask that you keep Jerry and Pam in your thoughts and prayers. Also hold the family of Jeffrey Fox, who passed away and whose service was uh, this week as well. And this coming Thursday will be a service here at the church for Patricia Hughes. That'll be Thursday at 1030 here in the church. So keep all of those families in your prayers. Also, the white bouquet on the altars in honor of the birth of a grandson to Bob and Kathy Richards. So uh, joyful events in the midst of uh, uh, life's sad events. We, we celebrate new life in the midst of, of, of all the seasons we, we know in life. We turn to our opening song. I guess I'll invite you to stand. Your, that song is printed right in the bulletin. Come thou font of every blessing.
Come, all you people, come from the depths of guilt and despair. From the busyness of life. From the grief of loss or disappointment. From the anxiousness of the world. To the feet of the Savior. To the throne of mercy. To the font of renewal. To the table of grace. Be gathered into the community of saints. Let us find the freedom of grace. Be renewed and strengthened. Let us sing the grace. Be filled with the love of the Lord. Let us delight in the joy of the Lord. Come, all you people. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for times of refreshment and peace in the course of this busy life. Grant that we may so use our leisure for the renewal of our bodies and minds, that our spirit may be open to the goodness of your creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We focus upon hearing the reading of God's word. And the first lesson comes to us from the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, or your son, or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Here ends our first reading. We'll, read, we'll sing responsibly the song printed before you. Shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song and sound the timbrel, the merry harp and the lyre. Blow the ram's horn at the new moon, and at the full moon the day of our feast. For this is a statue. solemn charge upon Joseph going out over the land of Egypt, where I heard a voice I did not know. I eased your shoulder from the burden, your hands were 
set free from the grave digger's basket. You called on me in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you from the secret place of thunder and tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O oh my people, and I will admonish you. O oh Israel, if you would but listen to me. There shall be no strange God among you. You shall not worship a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Our second reading is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the fourth chapter. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Here ends our readings. Please stand as you are able for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the second chapter. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and, they made their, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck great heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out immediately and conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. A lady opened her refrigerator and saw a rabbit sitting on one of the shelves. What are you doing in there, she said. Well, the rabbit replied, this refrigerator is a Westinghouse, isn't it? The lady said, well, yes, it is. And the rabbit said, well, I'm Westing. <laughs> Forgive the corny joke. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but I think we all might need a Westing place a quiet spot, uh, some downtime just to recharge our batteries and, and renew our spirits. Everyone needs 
a Sabbath. In fact, it's been God-ordered. That's what we heard in our first reading from Deuteronomy, where it said, six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox or your donkey or your livestock. Everyone and everything is told to take a break. And we need it, don't we? For the truth is, we're not very good at taking this order at face value. We know it as the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And what do we first think that means? Eh, you know, doing what you're doing. Go to church. You know, just one more thing on your to-do list. But what God really wanted was for God's people to rest, to take a break, to remember how once they were slaves and never got to rest. I mean, being a slave was not a nine-to-five job. It was 24-7, with no time to call your own. So when God set them free from slavery in Egypt, he wanted them to remember what life was like before so that they might realize how blessed they are now, now that they are free, free to take a break, free to relax, indeed even commanded to do so. We have that very same command, to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy by, by stopping all our frenzied activity and, and just resting for a while. We, you could say that we are commanded to get out of the rat race at least one day a week. But you know, I don't think our society takes this commandment very seriously. Or our world has, has not become any less hectic or complicated than the world at the time of Jesus, who was dealing with this whole issue of Sabbath rest in our gospel reading and of what kind of activity was allowed. I mean, whether one could even pick a few grains of, of, of wheat in order to satisfy their hunger or give a hand to someone in need. You see, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of, of Jesus' time, had twisted this command so that doing almost anything at all was breaking the law. To which Jesus responds by saying, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. In other words, God intended the Sabbath to be a blessing and not another burden, to be a time of rest and not a time to quibble over semantics about what was work and what was not. It was meant to give us a time to, to slow down, to catch our breath, to remember who's in control of this world and who's in control of our lives. I think we need to recapture that sense of Sabbath again. I don't care who you are or what your age is or whether you're still working or retired like me, you probably, find, you probably find yourself busier than you want to be. It's just the way things are. It comes with this modern age where stores are open 24-7 and all the rest, and we never seem able to get off the treadmill trying to keep up. It's a rat race out there and the rats are winning. But let me tell you what happens to rats. Some of you probably have heard the name Charles Swindoll. He's a, an evangelist and a preacher, and he tells about a research psychologist at the National Institute of Mental Health, a guy named John Calhoun, who was concerned about the effects of stress on modern life. He was convinced that he could prove his theory from a cage full of mice. <clears throat> his theory? That overcrowded conditions take a, a terrible toll on humanity. So Dr. Calhoun built a cage nine by nine feet for his mice. He observed them closely as the population grew. He started with eight mice, 
Now this cage was, was built to contain comfortably a population of 160. But Dr. Calhoun allowed the population to grow to 2,200. Now they weren't deprived of any of life's necessities except one, no privacy, no time, no space to be alone. Food, water, and, and other resources were always clean and in abundance. A pleasant temperature was maintained. No disease was present. All mortar, mor, mortality factors, except aging, were eliminated. This cage, except for the overcrowded condition, was really ideal for the mice. The population peaked at 2,200 after about two and a half years. Now, since there was no way for the mice to physically escape from their, their closed environment, Dr. Calhoun was interested in how they would handle themselves. Interestingly, as the population reached its peak, the colony of mice began to disintegrate. Strange things started happening. The males who had protected their territory withdrew from leadership. The females became more aggressive and forced out the young, even their own offspring. The young grew only to be self-indulgent. They ate and drank and slept and groomed themselves, but they showed little normal aggression and, most noteworthy, failed to reproduce. After five years, every mouse had died. This occurred despite the fact that right up to the end, there was plenty of food and water and an absence of disease. Well, this is really kind of a, a parable of modern life. For many people, just the simple task of, of getting to work is extremely draining. If you're a commuter, you know what I mean. There are way too many cars on the highway most of us don't want to get anywhere close to the interstate anymore. We hear of accidents almost every day. Shutdowns and backups that go on for hours and hours until at least the DOT finally has had the sense to, to reduce the speed limit to 55 miles per hour. Commuting time gets longer and longer. We have a term for the stress we feel when, when time travel frustrates us. It's called road rage. But whether it's driving a car, or sitting in front of a computer screen, or working all day long with clients, or even volunteering in some worthwhile cause, a person can only perform these emotionally and spiritually draining tasks for so long until it's time to say, enough. We burn out. You know, I have a hunch that more and more of us find ourselves in a place not unlike the Egypt those Hebrew slaves knew, except our slavery is self-constructed. Our slavery is self-imposed, therefore more difficult to detect and overcome. We're enslaved to the notion of success, and so put no limits on work. We're enslaved to the idea that our children should have every opportunity possible. And therefore, we, we keep their, their schedule full and, and structured and wonder why they have so little, uh, why they have trouble focusing. We are enslaved to the belief that nothing can bring us contentment except more. More money, more cars, more things to put on our resume or in our closet. More. We get caught up in a race we can't win, the rat race. That's why the Sabbath is so important. It is God's invitation to get off the treadmill of work or of striving after more so that we can rest, so that maybe we'll even notice God's presence and God's blessing and experience a sense of confidence contentment and gratitude. So I challenge you this week to give yourself permission to rest.
Maybe even go one step further and consider one thing you won't do this week. One evening when you turn off the computer, you shut down that cell phone. I know, that's blasphemy. Maybe you want to skip a meeting or an obligation and just find some quiet time. And then consider one thing you will do in order to rest. Maybe take a walk. Paint a picture, enjoy the sunset, play a game with a child, or just sit and contemplate your blessings so that you might go to bed that night content and grateful. I've got to warn you, though, it may not be as easy as it sounds. For some of us may have to give up some destructive, yet rather attractive habits that have been shaped over time of running this rat race, afraid we're going to lose out on something if we don't keep going. But who knows? Along with what we might lose, we just might gain our lives and find our souls again. Amen. Let's sing together. You'll find the hymn books, uh, if you're in the chairs, under the chair in, in front. And we're going to sing 608, 608, softly and tenderly. We stand together with Christians throughout the centuries and throughout the world today, 
to affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the rest. Amen. Knit together as one community in you, Lord, we offer prayers for ourselves, our neighbors, and the whole of your creation. God, our strength, you command your people to keep Sabbath. Coax your church away from the busyness of the world and give us holy rest. So that refreshed, we give vibrant witness to your world's healing love. Lord, in your mercy. God, our strength, you restore what is withered. As all creation stretches forth in hunger and thirst for you, revive what has ceased to flourish and repair what has fallen into decay. Make us partners in your holy healing. Lord, in your mercy. God, our strength, we ache for peace. Teach nations that you carry our burdens, you free human hands, and you rescue us in distress. Raise up leaders in the world who listen to your voice and walk in your ways. Lord, in your mercy. God, our strength, people are afflicted and perplexed, persecuted and struck down. Shine the light of your glory into the hearts of your suffering ones, especially those affected by recent mass shootings or know the devastation of recent floods and storms so that they may not be crushed, driven to despair, or forsaken. Lord, in your mercy. God, our strength, you grieve our hardness of heart whenever we turn your holy counsel into rules to control others. Open our hearts to your loving will for these times, for our neighbors, and for this community of faith. Lord, in your mercy. God, our strength, death is at work in us, but life is in you. Free us now to live into your promise of indestructible life. And in the end, restore us with all your saints. We lift to you those who know the reality of death and who walk in sorrow in these days, especially the families of Phyllis Wells, Jeff Fox, and Patricia Hughes. Lord, in your mercy. By the sure guidance of your Holy Spirit, O God, we lift our prayers in trust and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Share that peace with one another.
as we continue with the great thanksgiving. We gather in this place, some empty, some filled, some whole, some broken. We come with these ordinary people who have shown us the way. We surround the table of grace so we might be fed by the bread of life. And so we remember in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then after the supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Exalted God, you are the constant lover who never forsakes us. You are the parent who cradles her ch children. You are the teacher patiently repeating your words for us. Jesus Christ, in you we are convinced God loves us. Through you we are formed into your people. With you we serve those the world has forgotten. We follow you. Holy Spirit, you are the power that gives us peace. You are the wisdom that reveals the broken in our midst. You are the spokesperson to whom we are deaf. We welcome you. God in community, we lift our prayers to you as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The things of God for the people of God. Come, all things are now ready. You may be seated. We will be communing at the rail today, which means you just come forward. You may kneel or stand, and we'll commune. And as you depart, there are tables to receive, with trays to receive your empty glasses on each end.
Please stand. Now the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. We have been fed with the word of life and the bread of heaven. Let us go with the blessings of the Father to follow the ways of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Our hymn is 785. 785, when peace like a river.
Go in peace. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. You may go. All's well. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.